Merci beaucoup Alain. Euh, nous avons commencé avec 10 minutes de retard, nous sommes parfaitement dans les temps euh, et euh, je, je vous en remercie. Euh, sans plus tarder, je vais présenter le second intervenant. Euh, nous restons dans le Nord, n'est-ce pas, euh, selon la parité que j'ai annoncée euh, au début de, euh, de, de la journée, avec Dupree Williams, euh, qui est un archéologue et un historien de l'art, qui a eu la chance et le privilège d'être le conservateur en chef des euh, collections grecques et romaines du British Museum, euh, donc euh, vraiment un trésor des trésors, euh, et qui euh, est depuis quelques années directeur de recherche au Centre de recherche en archéologie euh, et patrimoine à l'Université libre de Bruxelles. Euh, un historien euh, de l'art, un archéologue qui a publié euh, sur les antiquités euh, dont il avait euh, la charge. Euh, un de ses livres s'appelle « The Parthenon Sculptures, Cleaning and Controversy euh, »« euh, euh, Nettoyage et controverse, euh, et controverse autour des sculptures du euh, Partenon. Il est l'auteur aussi des Masterpieces of Classical Art, des chefs-d'œuvre de l'art classique, et uh, The Aegina uh, Treasure, Aegean Bronze Jewelry and a Mystery Revisited, un ouvrage sur le trésor d'Aegine et euh, la. Euh, la reconsidération d'un mystère. Euh, C'est un, un grand spécialiste des vases grecs, du Parthénon lui-même, et notamment de ses frises et de ses sculptures. Et c'est un des premiers spécialistes du domaine, et c'est pourquoi il m'est particulièrement cher, euh, à s'être penché sur la dimension locale des acquisitions de Lord Elgin en Grèce et à Constantinople, euh, à la fois pour ce qui est des euh, sarcophages d'empereurs byzantins et bien sûr, euh, les éléments architecturaux et décoratifs du euh, Parthénon. Euh, euh, C'est donc avec beaucoup de plaisir et, euh, et, et d'honneur que j'invite Dupree Williams à euh, présenter euh, son intervention sur les musulmans, les Raya, Raya étant le nom que l'on donne au XIXe siècle aux sujets ottomans non musulmans, et francs, euh, les francs étant bien sûr les Européens dans ce même euh, contexte, et des réactions à Lord Elgin et ses artistes. Thank you very much. Je rappelle que euh, vous avez la traduction euh, simultanée euh, si vous servez de votre casque. Thank you very much indeed, Adam, and thank you so much for inviting me here and giving me the chance to meet you and your colleagues. Um, I only um, regret that this entails me producing a paper for you today. Um, I must also apologize for speaking in English. That is painful for you, I know, but I assure you it would be more painful if I spoke French. In many ways, the world and our story begins with Napoleon and his um, conquest of Egypt, his attack in 1798, um, his seizure of um, Cairo. Um, but Horatio Nelson was not far behind, and he um, defeated the French fleet and, re and changed the balance of power. And what we talk about the whole of today in this sort of period, in this sort of area, and certainly for the sculptures of the Parthenon, we are talking about um, that change of policy which allowed um, the British to hold sway in Constantinople, whereas previously, and in a sense habitually, it had been the French who had held power. And it's against this background that Lord Elgin was appointed um, ambassador in, in 1798. And I will take you through some of the history, because if I concentrated just on the local voices, we would be out of here in two minutes. That's the scale of the discrepancy. So I will set the history for you so you can begin to judge not only the local voices, but also the actions and other voices. I begin in the Dardanelles, Elgin arriving in his boat with his entourage 
is held there by bad weather, isn't everybody or wasn't everybody. Um, there waiting for him, I think, was the Capitan Pasha, um, the admiral of the fleet, of the Ottoman fleet. And this was to meet this new representative of Britain in a new context in which uh, the Ottoman port wanted to have considerable influence because they wanted to drive the French out of Egypt. Egypt was theirs, and this must be stopped. So Britain was this ally, and Elgin was the person they had to go to and wanted to encourage. And we see quite extraordinarily from the letters of Lord Elgin and his wife, Lady Elgin, um, the contact, even at this first moment, with the Ottomans. And I'll concentrate first on these Ottomans in Constantinople, because in a sense, this is a voice which sets everything in motion. Um, we know a fair amount about Captain um, Pasha and his actions. Uh, he was uh, a very close associate of the Sultan. Um, uh, he was probably, as was most of the, the port, French orientated, but was clearly willing to have a connection with the English. Um, he was accompanied by someone who was called uh, his confidential secretary, Isaac Bey. Um, in, in, in beginning to look at these sorts of issues and voices, it's very difficult to work out who was who. And Isaac Bey becomes a figure, but what do we actually know of him? Lord Eldelgin, in his letters, recall, rec recalls him as Isaac Bey, who acts as his confidential secretary to Captain Pasha, has much acquaintance with European manners and language. Lady Elgin, whose letters are always much more fun to read, um, she's quite a, um, a giddy character, one feels. Uh, she says, Isaac Bey, the Pasha's great man, is 48. He has traveled all about for 18 years, and speaks French perfectly. Remarkably polite, was in England for a few weeks. On his return from his travels, he was banished to one of the islands in the archipelago, that means Greek islands, and a man sent with him who had orders to hide his body and bring back his head. Fortunately for him, they were taken by Algerian pilot, pirates, and in this Sultan's time, he is in the highest regard. Now, if we look at Isaac a bit more, he was in fact an important companion of Selim during his confinement while his predecessor was in power, um, as was his tutor, um, Ebu Bekir Ratib Efendi, and please excuse, excuse my pronunciation of, of um, Turkish too. And of course, his closest companion was uh, the Captain Pasha to be um, Kuyuk Hussein. It was indeed this Isaac who was Selim's messenger to Louis XVI in Paris, where he traveled in 1776 to 8, and in 1782 to 4, and in 1786 to 90, asking for cooperation against Russian and Austrian aggression. He's recorded as being on a boat with Charles Gouffier in 1784, and in 1785 he becomes involved in this um, port the conflict between the Grand Vizier and the then Captain Pasha. Um, that Captain Pasha is demoted and the Grand Vizier is arrested. There seems to have been some sort of plot to, to get rid of the Sultan and replace him with Selim. The result is that the Grand Vizier is taken off to an island, strangled, and his head brought back to Constantinople. Um, Isaac seems to have escaped thanks to those pirates that um, Lady Elgin mentioned. The fact that he was in England for a couple of weeks, he was probably connected with a change of ambassadors in that country. Now, that's a lot about someone, but it's an important position in all of this, understanding how the connections went on. And there is, amongst the, the drawings in Broom Hall in Lord Elgin's collection, this um, drawing of a card game. Now, the Elgin family believe it's a drawing by Lucieri and that it shows um, Lord Elgin and Lady Elgin playing cards with the Sultan. 
but this is of course impossible the sultan would never have had that sort of contact with foreigners these wretched franks this was impossible it was also impossible essentially for the captain pasha to have done the same he did visit the embassy once but that caused a sensation in constantinople and i'm sure and he certainly never sat down to eat or do anything so I think what we have here is the first image of Isaac Bey sitting, playing cards with Lord and Lady Elgin, accompanied on his right hand by J.P. Morier, who was one of um, Elgin's uh, secretaries who was brought up in Izmir and so had very good languages and able to explain things to him. But Isaac was well adjusted to the European tradition. Then another area was the ladies, what we might call now the back channel, that was a way for the Ottoman port to communicate with some of these ambassadors and their um, uh, families, because communication directly between the Sultan and any of these people was extremely difficult. It was always controlled and policed in a sense. So this was a way by contact, making contact through um, the female sides of these groups to, um, to have things done. And in fact, one of the connections is Lady Elgin was um, asked by the mother of the Sultan through um, the wife of the Captain Pasha to try and help get Lord Keith to give more um, troops and uh, ships to help the uh, Ottoman cause in Egypt. Uh, Adam mentioned um, the sarcophagus, and he tells me he thinks it's kitsch. Um, we see it on the left. Um, this was made from um, a, um, porphyry brought back by Lord Elgin, and Adam has very clearly put forward the, uh, the process by which this was acquired. We have the documents um, down to the last detail where the um, sultan is rather sort of fed up with the process of being asked for pieces of, of, of porphyry and marble and just says, essentially, get on with it, do what he wants. Um, and that's important in our understanding of, of all of this um, connection between antiquities, what we think of as archaeology, and the Ottomans is that it had no particular interest or significance to them. It did have a value as they began to learn politically as a way to encourage and discourage these uh, ambassadors. <coughs> the Sigion relief, um, you see a view of two pieces that were taken under similar circumstances by Lord Elgin, a relief on the left, a basis for a tomb, and on the right, uh, an inscription face upwards, which was heavily worn, um, and it was apparently at the time um, thought to help with rheumatism in its, in particular, and members of the flock of the church, the, the people, um, would rub themselves, sit on it, and thus get better. Um, it's, we, we'll come across this sort of use of antiquities in um, um, superstitious, para-religious fashion as we go on. At the heart of it all, for, 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 for understanding this, is that lost um, fearman, as it's been called, that it gave Lord Elgin's artists and men in Athens permission to um, excavate and take sculptures and other objects, other uh, stones away. Um, it's clear when we look at it and we see what happened that the Fearman, although it is lost, it has not been found, the original Turkish, this is an Italian translation done at the time, so that Hunt, who took it to Athens, could um, understand it and speak from it. Uh, we don't have the Turkish original, but it is clear from many different areas and aspects that it actually existed, and that what it did give permission to do was to excavate and to remove but it does not, did not give permission to remove the sculptures from the buildings, or at least that was not specified in the Fearman, it would seem. That, of course, doesn't mean that permission wasn't given. 
it clearly was given on the spot. Um, and I've put in uh, the side the key Ottomans who worked um, in this process, and the Celebi uh, Mustafa Rashid Effendi was an important figure. He was extremely close to the Sultan, um, another, uh, and part of the inner circle, a sort of a sort of kitchen cabinet, as it's been called from, from 1792. Um, the um, Kaimakam, of course, was the most port important and senior person in the Ottoman port after the, the Sultan at this period because the Grand Vizier was away on, on expedition in Egypt. The interesting, most, most interesting figure really is Mehmed Rashid Aga, uh, Mubashir, that means a bringer of good news. Um, he was sent with Hunt and the British group um, to see that the Fehrman was um, obeyed, to help them, um, but also to accompany uh, Hunt, who was to go on to a tour of the Morea, and then a year later, Hamilton, who was touring in Egypt and central Greece as well as Athens. He was alongside them to help them, but also he has a, a sort of, I think, a military role. He has a spying role. He is looking not only at what the English are doing, but he is also looking at what is going on in Greece. So he is not just a simple facilitator. He has a real role for the Ottoman benefit. Now, the travelers are the biggest um, source of our information, and um, we can read them, but I think we need to read them with a certain amount of skepticism. Um, I mean, in these days when we have um, um, what we talk of as fake news or alternative truth or even evidence-free claims, um, we have to assess as historians, what they are saying and why they are saying it. I've begun to list the various travellers who have gone, and I haven't time, obviously, to talk about them all, but there seem to be phases of these journeys of people going out, and we'll see them after about 1810 increase exponentially. I'll concentrate first on these two characters, William Gell, or Gell, as I, sh I think I should pronounce it, William Gell and Edward Dodwell, um, who were out in Athens in 1801. Um, they went back again in 1805, but they were there when Lord Elgin's men, Lucieri, his art, chief artist, and his, his assistants, were first approaching the Acropolis to excavate and then to remove objects from the Parthenon and other buildings. Um, and so they are an important contemporary record, but their voices we have to be careful with. They are also artists, and so we get a pictorial image to go with the words of their publications, which we should note, although they were there in 1801, they didn't write it up until eight, and publish it until 1819. And much has happened, and there's been much interference in their memories and their presentations by that time. But it's interesting to see some of the images. We see on the top left uh, William Gell's view of the corner of the Parthenon with only a ladder in place. This is and a, sort of a, a little um, sledge underneath one of the metopes. This is when the artists were doing work on the building in terms of drawing and molding before any removals were begun. The first step um, after the Fearman um, was excavation, and here we see, um, uh, I think it is Atkins who was with uh, Gell and Dodwell, depicting actual excavation going on and the finds being then drawn by Elgin's chief um, uh, sculptor, sculptural artist, uh, Fyodor Ivanov. Dodwell, who was there with Gell and Atkins, his pictures all come from 1805, from the second visit. He, is, he kept records clearly of what happened in 1801, but his finished pictures are an amalgam of 1801 and 1805 and 
and, and of course, the imagination of an artist. And um, we have to be very careful for that reason. On uh, the, the top right, the view of the Parthenon shows all of the metopes in place, and it was the metopes that were first removed by Lucieri. They're all, all in place, so that is telling us 1801, but the pedimental figures have gone, and so it is post-1805, so he is mixing periods. And also, of course, um, some of the small buildings, as on the bottom right slide, uh, had been removed before the work got underway. And here we see, supposedly, uh, a meadow being lowered from the building. But again, this is an artist's vision of it. We know from contemporary sources that there were, in fact, 20 Greeks used in the process, as well as five crew members from the ship. Uh, it was a much more busy scene than the artist went, wishes to give us. Dodwell is also um, a source of the first reaction to Elgin's work, uh, the first disapproval of it, um, but as I say, it's written in 1819, and so we must be very careful of it, although it seems so accurate and explicit, it isn't always. And I quote you some. During my first tour of Greece, I had the inexpressible mortification of being present when the Parthenon was despoiled of its finest sculptures, and when some of its architectural members were thrown to the ground. This is inaccurate. It's has uh, an effect in words, but it's not truly exactly accurate. They were fixed between the triglyphs as in a groove, and in order to lift them up, it was necessary to throw to the ground the magnificent cornice by which they were covered. Again, no, that's not really true. Um, there seems to be an occasion of only one falling to the ground. On many of these, in this area, there was no um, member above the metopes itself. What Lucieri's men did do, clearly, though, was to hack at the corners of the triglyphs, those th triple elements between the, the, um, the metopes, in order to get the, the metopes out, because they, had, they were overlapped by this, and the marble, after many years, tends to sort of merge together to seal itself um, as uh, other people who have removed metopes from um, temples have discovered uh, the first being, um, I think, Augustus on the Temple of Aphaea and Aegina, where all the metopes were removed in exactly the same fashion, and we have no idea what they showed. And then, of course, the uh, restorers, the modern restorers of the Parthenon, had the same pro problem when they wanted to remove the metopes. Um, Dodwell goes on, it's painful to reflect that these trophies of human genius, which had resisted the silent decay of time, during a period of more than 22 centuries, which had escaped the destructive fury of the iconoclasts, the inconsiderate rapacity of the Venetians, and the barbarous violence of the Mohammedans, should have been doomed at last to experience the devastating outrage which will never cease to be deplored. Elgin's involvement. He goes on to admit, however, the advantages to the progress of the arts for England um, but wishes that only antiquities that lay around or might be excavated were removed and not things on buildings. So this is a perfectly, we think now, a reasonable um, division of what was done and not done. Um, this wasn't something that was set in stone as um, a, a program, you only did this, you didn't do that, because essentially no one had been able, in a position, to remove things from buildings before, so the question had not come up. It's only afterwards we begin to see it being judged. Um, and th my third long quote for him, furthermore, he, he says, nor have I any hesitation in declaring that the Athenians in general, nay, even the Turks themselves, did lament the ruin that was committed and loudly and openly blamed their sovereign for the permission that he had granted. I was on the spot at the time and had opportunity of observing and indeed participating in the sentiment of indignation which such conduct, un conduct universally inspired. The whole proceeding was so unpopular in Athens that it was necessary to pay the laborers more than their usual profits before any could be prevailed upon to assist in this work of profanation. 
But remember, this was written in 1819, and that is after the collection of Lord Elgin had arrived in London and had been acquired for the British Museum. Um, in talking about some of those things, he, he, he first of all, he, he comments on the wages. Um, and again, you think, oh gosh, yes, um, he, uh, El Lucieri is bribing with high wages. Well, it seems very clear that he would have had to pay high wages to get people to work such hard physical work, lifting and moving sculptures. It was dangerous in case they fell. These were big weights they were dealing with. Um, and so to pay high wages, one would expect to have to do. But we find it very difficult to judge, you know, is this true or not? Not least because a, later source, a contemporary Greek source um, Benizelos, who we come to later, notes that in 1799, 1800, the city was very calm and peaceful, and there was a huge input of in, influx of people, and prices had soared, and that prices had quadrupled or quintupled at that period. So what relation that has to paying workers more is very difficult for us now to look back and assess. Um, he also gives this impression that there was um, a continued um, revolt amongst both Greeks and Turks at what was being done. And it's important for us now to try and think, can we find that? Is it reliable comment, or, uh, and can we find these sorts of people? Um, of course... Uh, Dodwell and Gell had other problems with Lucieri, as we shall see. And again, there's, a, there's an edge to what he is saying that is a personal conflict. Um, as I say, this only began to be written and shown and published in 1819, but we do in fact have a document of 1803 in something called the Gentleman's Magazine, um, a collection of um, comments by everyone everywhere, which was avidly read by everyone in Britain. And in this document, um, which a letter, an anonymous letter, uh, is written to the editor um, from Rome, it would seem, in August. And he, the person who's writing it has seen Lord Elgin's team, who've come back now, left Athens, passing through Rome before they go to their own cities. And so it's an interesting comment at that moment the writer records that Elgin did receive permission to remove and ship off whatever suited him. Again, a confirmation of this permission. But it must be owned they afterwards made such good use of the opportunity afforded them that future travellers will not be much inclined to bless the memory of Lord Elgin. In other words, again, this is a sense of exceeding what was allowed. Um, and it goes on to say, this may be considered the last gleaning of what had been spared by the successive spoilers of the ornaments of Greece. Um, not only have all movable works been carried away, but many things which had been considered hitherto immovable have been torn away from their places where they had remained unmolested for thousands of years. Um, who was this mystery voice in Rome in 1803? I think the answer, given the sort of... Um, the style of the writing was Dodwell, who was in Rome in 1803 and may well have concocted this letter to Gentleman's Magazine. Um, the relationship between Dodwell and Gell is difficult to understand, and, um, but they seem very much to have operated together and in tandem, they were great friends. Um, Lucieri, writing in 1805 in Athens, says um, that Gell has been trouble, stirring up trouble against him in Athens. Um, he persuaded the French here, he says, with whom he and all the others share their pleasures. But the ambassador, it's not Elgin, but his successor, Drummond, is completely opposed to the works I have carried out. And for that reason, he doesn't little to protect them. This charming talk has reached the ears of the Vovoid, Vovoid who has stopped me from continuing to dig. Um, again, Drummond, the succeeding ambassador, was Gell's personal friend. So there is a, you know, there are 
issues and manoeuvres going on. And finally, oddly, while Elgin was in detention in Paris in 1805, having been arrested on the way back from, from um, Greece as, as um, war overtook him, um, he says he received a letter from an anonymous Englishman, tra Englishman traveller complaining of Lucieri taking down part of the frieze of the Parthenon. Immediately, he was taken into close confinement, away from his family, and then taken to Melun. This was surely, I think, the doing of Jell and Dodwell, singly or together, this sending of anonymous letter, which then affects the um, dealing of Elgin, dealing with Elgin in, in, in Paris. Um, so there's, it's a complex story, whatever one feels about what was done, we are trying to understand how people were reacting at the time. Another figure is E.D. Clark, the Reverend E.D. Clark, um, who was out in 1801, at the end of 1801, after Jell and Dodwell. Um, and he uh, met the Elgins in Constantinople before going on to Greece. He was a, a, a tutor for a traveling rich boy. Um, and as they came back across the Aegean Islands from, they'd been in Egypt and in the Holy Land before coming to Athens, um, he stopped on Patmos and collected a large group of manuscripts, one of them called now the Clark Plato, and is the oldest surviving manuscript of Plato's Tetralogies 1 to 6, and um, probably the first volume of a, a pair of volumes. Um, and we know it's dated to AD 895. So it's a very early and very important piece. Um, these acquisitions were done in the usual fashion with a bit of purchase and with a bit of putting things under your cloak. Um, and he got away with some very fine manuscripts, um, which he later sold to uh, the Bodleian Library in Oxford. Uh, he had also formed a collection of marbles which were given to Cambridge who then gave him an honorary doctorate. This is the sort of manipulation, again, for, for personal benefit. Um, these manuscripts were to be later condemned, uh, the removal of them for, from Patmos were to be condemned, condemned by um, Adamantinos um, uh, Corais explicitly. And that's the first reference to in Corias's work to um, displeasure at the removal of part of Greek heritage. Um, Clark was in Athens um, and he reports again, I quote for you, uh, the removal of a metope from the Parthenon uh, lifted, uh, the adjoining masonry was loosened and down came the fine masses of Pentelican marble scattering their white fragments with thundering noise amongst the, the ruins so that the Dizdar, the chief on the Acropolis, actually took the pipe from his mouth, letting fall a tear, said in the most emphatic tone of voice, Telos, stop. Now, this dramatically charged account presents us, as historians trying to assess it, with some difficulties. For two metopes were removed while Clark was in Greece, but both were actually taken down while he was away on a trip in the Morea. He was on the Acropolis on the 4th of November um, and could have seen the preparations for the removal of one, but uh, he doesn't mention that at all. He's more concerned in writing at this point about his embarrassment of having gone into a hammam during ladies' hour, as it were, and caused a scandal in the city and feared for his life, all of these ramifications of doing something like that. Um, so we, again, we have to be very careful when we read these accounts. They're dramatizing things that happened or may have happened, um, and things can be got wrong and overemphasized. Um, and we can begin to judge Clark from his contemporary letters to his friend William Otter, rather than his published account uh, later, and where, in which he makes no mention whatsoever of this particular story or event um, He's upset at what is going on, the removal of the reliefs, but has no particular story like this. And we get the feeling that this is very much his creation 
and something he really liked because he wrote to Lord Byron later about it and gave him the full story, which is then republished by Lord Byron. Um, Lord El uh, um, Clark removed um, a, a large sculpture from Eleusis, of which we know a great deal about. It had been seen for many years before. Um, it's been clearly um, defaced by um, Christians early on. Uh, it was buried up to its shoulders in um, dung, and the local population believed that by putting their manure next to uh, the statue of Ceres, the, the goddess of um, the crops, would improve its uh, efficacy and would uh, make things <laughs> make things better. Okay. Um, now uh, he has to at the, at the, when he's trying to remove it, he gets the the local clergyman to strike the first blow, getting rid of the the dung, and this is a nice inter. inter interaction between the clergy and um, the locals. I must move on rapidly, yes? Yeah, I'm sorry. I've got far too, I've got far too much to say, as usual. Um, these sort of accusers circled around Lord Elgin with these stories, and there was a great deal of talk in, amongst travellers and in Britain on this sort of uh, area. Uh, I won't go on any further about it. Um, it's a complex scenario to understand. Interesting to turn to two architects who visited Athens when um, Lucieri was working and judge their reactions and also see what they produced once they got home. Um, Robert Smirk on the left uh, was very upset at the removal of um, some of the blocks over the frieze. Um, and, but William Wilkins says well, actually, um, there's no real e effect on the traveler visiting it. You, wouldn't, you won't notice anything. And when I was there, I didn't see anything disturbing. So you get different voices, um, different extremes. And again, one has to think out why. Uh, Fauvel, of course, is the person that Lucieri in Athens was, was in competition with. And we can begin to put together quite a bit about Fauvel and Alessia Zambon in the audience has written a wonderful book on um, Fauvel and um, his, his time and what he did. And I just show you uh, elements of uh, Fauvel having a cup of coffee, uh, supposedly in front of his easel. Um, there are two cups of coffee, one presumably for the artist painting as well as himself. Uh, we see his house has been found by the American excavations. The consulate was somewhere different, and we see it in the center on the low, lower screen. Um, and a rather charming view by Dupre of um, a lady in an Athenian dress, who I think is, is um, Marianne of Rock, seen from the upstairs of the consulate out over the, the door into the passaporta, into the, 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 the Roman agora. Choiseul Gouffier, this is, this is a difficult story, and I don't really have time to go into it. He was um, interested in acquiring sculptures and collection and made, in fact, a, a large collection, and he acquired pieces from the Parthenon, sometimes in rather dubious circumstances, um, sometimes perfectly clearly. Um, again, Edem has looked at what documents there are in, Ot in the Ottoman archives as to what sort of permissions he has. And again, there's some information, but we are missing other pieces of information. Um, the Captain Truge on the, on the right um, came to Athens with uh, Lady Craven, and she records uh, the attempt to remove a, a meadow from the building itself. Whether this is accurate reporting or not is, again, an issue, but he was clearly there. It's the same sort of proto version of what Elgin was doing. Um, 1810, we see an explosion, an explosion, really, of travellers into this area. Um, and I've listed as, as many as I could think of, but I'm sure I've missed a great deal of them. There was a slight hiatus in this um, visiting when, of course, Napoleon was on the loose again and before the Battle of Waterloo, and then it settled down again afterwards. 
Of these people, one should remember Lord Byron. Um, this is... Uh, Lord Byron had taken against Elgin and his collection before he ever went to Athens. He saw it in its temporary display uh, in Park Lane and um, gives a description of, of, of what he sees in a publication in 1809 before he goes to Greece. He says, let Aberdeen and Elgin, that's Lord Aberdeen, still pursue the shade of fame through regions of Virtu, waste useless thousands on their Phidian freaks, misshapen monuments and maimed antiques, and make their grand saloons a general mart for the all mutilated blocks of art. Um, Byron, again, is, 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 a, is a wonderfully eloquent of what is going on, we will find, but um, he, has, he is a satirist, and he is an angry satirist, we must remember. Um, he then went to Athens with his close friend, Hobhouse, and there um, Byron had his first interaction with antiquity and the Parthenon. Um, Hobhouse was a different character altogether. How they got on together, I haven't a clue. It must have been a very strange relationship. Hobhouse immediately went out looking at everything, writing hundreds of notes. Um, he was really interested in understanding um, about the antiquities, and he also had interest in the local Greeks and Turks. Um, Byron was not. Um, he immediately sat down on a column drum uh, near the Temple of Zeus and started to write Charles Harold, his next poem. He actually only went on the Acropolis once. We think of him being there for months and months, and he never went up more than once because he was had a bad leg and climbing or walking were very difficult for him. So we hear of him riding around elsewhere in Attica, but not on the Acropolis. So it's these things we need to bear in mind. Hobhouse, though, is a very interesting figure who tries to summarize some of the issues that we have begun to see, um, trying to uh, discuss the basic questions. Would they, the objects have been destroyed if they had not been removed by Elgin? Would the French have removed them if they had had the chance? And so he is speculating on these different scenarios. Um, and I, I won't go any further than, than just to say that this, this footnote that he writes this in is, is interesting to read, but again, one has to read it with caution. Hophouse also talks about superstition, and we will have superstition, I think, coming later, so perhaps I should ex exclude some of the ideas about superstition um, and the idea that it represents a proto-archaeology. Personally, I tend to think of it as a para-religion. It is a belief system that has nothing to do with archaeology because archaeology, in a sense, did not exist. And we, we, we don't have to in, have it invented earlier. Um, I wanted to show you some more of the people because, for me, it's always the images and the objects that are of interest. The, the um, Voivode on the left is the character who was there when Lord Elgin's Fearman was um, presented and raised no objection whatsoever to what he was doing. On the right, in the top, you see the Dizdar on the, on the Acropolis, the man in red robes. Um, he seems to have been a, a fairly um, violent and rapacious type he's, record, he's recorded as, and no doubt he made huge profit from all of Elgin's work. Below, we see a view of the, the Voivoda Lichter, where the Voivode's offices were behind the Hadrian's Library in a, in a wonderful series of views uh, that I think were taken from Logothetis' house. Voivodes and Dizdars and bishops, we begin to see the interaction between these groups over um, some monuments that were destroyed, such as the, the temple by the Ilissos, um, the which the blocks of which were in fact sold to the bishop of Athens to begin to build a new church for himself, um, not as is usually assumed was just lost when um, Haji Haseki, the voivode, built walls around um, Athens. The, the process had begun before that in a complicit action between uh, the Ottoman and the Orthodox Church. And of course on the right of block from the Erechtheum taken down by the Dizdar and put in front of the um, entrance to the um, 
Acropolis with a Turkish inscription on it. Um, also, we think of the destruction that was going on, and we hear again and again they were destroying the antiquities when we were there. And it's very easy for commentators now to say, oh, this is imagined, this is exaggerated, this is not true, if that's what they want to say. But in, if we really look at what was going on, this cannot be doubted. We have again and again information about, for example, um, the Turks making tombstones out of antiquities. Here, a, a nice um, column drum that's being reshaped, as it were. And the use of cannonballs, marble cannonballs, is something we never really think about. Um, there was a huge demand for um, marble cannonballs to fire from the cannons. They were lighter and than uh, iron, and iron, of course, was much harder to get hold of. There was plenty of, of um, marble around to make this, these sort of um, weapons. And, in fact, old marble was better than fresh marble because it exploded on contact and caused more havoc and, dem and demolition. Um, there's a, a wonderful passage. I mean, this is something that covers the whole of the Ottoman world. It's not just Athens, but it's everywhere. And we see it in, in, um, in the Troad as well, where one traveler stays with a Turkish mason who had his livelihood turning things into cannonballs. Um, the damage on the Parthenon is there too and is incontrovertible. When it was done and who it was done by is a whole different topic. But we should notice, for example, the, the cast of one block of the frieze made in 1686 or 7 by Fauvel and the state it was in when Lord Elgin acquired it. And if we look a bit further back from the middle of the 18th century onwards, there were huge losses to the pediment figures as well as to frieze slabs. So the process was ongoing destruction. Um, what did the Lucieri and his team make of all of this? Uh, Elgin seems to have felt no compunction whatsoever of what was going on. Um, he had done things the right way and he was doing this to save antiquity. Lucieri was much more aware of what was going on. He was doing it and he clearly showed um, remorse at some of the things he'd had to do. Um, but again, it's not the whole thing, it's just when there were occasional mishaps. Um, the removal of the Cariatid was one of the great um, causes, cause célèbre. Um, amongst the local clergy, we find once Elgin starts his process, um, the bishop gives him and his relatives presents. And this is an exchange of presents, um, but it is, in a sense, saying, the church saying, these are of no particular interest to us. We know they are of particular interest to you, and we give them to you. Um, Logothetti, who was the British consul there, also gave things to Lord Elgin. He was a Greek, a, a long um, uh, ancient family, Archontes rulers, um, but he gave things, especially at the moment when um, Lucieri had started to take things off the building, and there was an... Um, the, the Dizdar was clearly upset, but so was Logothetti at what was going on. He felt it was doing too much. But then he stood back and said, oh, well, no, it's okay. And to make up for it, he gave presents to Lord Elgin. The lone, the single Greek voice that one f finds at this person, at this moment, is someone called Yanis Benizelos, who was a, um, a, a teacher in Athens, in the school, the Decca school. And... He was, he's a very interesting figure who one would like to spend more time looking at. Um, he was an author of several of, of, of various documents. They were never published, but he was a historian and trying to assess the history of Athens, um, especially the modern history, which was becoming more of interest to them. Um, but he has nothing in his text that has anything to do with the m monuments, this was outside their, their, their interests or their uh, educational system to understand the context of any philosopher that they might happen to read the text of. Um, but in this, this passage at the end there, um, 
he, he uh, there's a letter written in 1803 um, to John Hawkins, who was a, uh, a visitor earlier. Uh, it's very interesting to see this. He's thanking Hawkins for 100 piastres because the school was going downhill and there was no financing and various travellers helped. And he says uh, at, at, the, at the end of it um, that uh, it's too, much to be... Um, I mean, he, first of all, he says, the Turks are quiet and they do no damage or ill to the Greeks. Almost all of the power rests in the hands of the Greeks. A great peace and security reigns. And this is giving us some idea of you know, what the local Greek population was like and what it could do and where it was. Um, he describes increases in prices, but it ends, he ends his letter with, nevertheless, one thing would make you not a little sad as it does all those who have some idea of these things, the last deplorable stripping of the temple of Athena on the Acropolis and of the other relics of antiquity, like a noble and wealthy bride who has lost all her jewellery and finery. Oh, how we Athenians should remember this event and how much praise and admiration we owe to the ancient heroes of Rome, Pompey and Hadrian, when we look on these things. Um, it's that phrase, all those who have some idea of these things, that rings in one's mind when one reads it. Um, it is telling us of what is essentially, I think, a, a rather desperate isolation. He saw what was going on was wrong and bad for, for uh, Greek heritage. His colleagues didn't. And this was, no doubt, the result of um, poor education. There were only two schools in Athens. Um, the one he taught at, the Decca School and the Semini of Greek, Seminary of Greek Studies. Um, these were going downhill fast with financial problems. Elgin bought two pieces from the seminary, which had already closed. And we see outside Athens the voices of um, the Greek regeneration, especially someone like Korais, who realizes the problem of the removal of antiquities, wants to do something about it, talks about setting up a museum, he talks about the uh, clerk having removed manuscripts, and he wants to set up a museum on Chios, which might have been a disaster given later and objects, but anyway. Um, and we see people like... Um, well, Korais was living in Paris, so none of our travelers had any c contact with him, and... What he was saying was only getting to anyone in Athens in the form of books that he wrote. And so there was little real connection. Salidas um, in Yanina was much closer and was seen by most travellers who came that route south um, through from northern Europe. Um, he uh, made comments about um, the, the sculptures which, which ring with us um, now and have been said by others, um, he's quoted as, you English are carrying off the works of the Greeks, our forefathers, preserve them well, we, will, we Greeks will come and re-demand them. This appears in a number of visitors going through, um, but Salidas was clearly a very acerbic figure and none of the certainly British visitors liked him much, but none of the people who are resident in Yanina, such as Pukvil even, or, or Leek, seem to have had much contact with him. And it must have something to do with his acerbic character. And one reads the name Salidas, which in Greek means scissors, and one feels, as they say in Greece, onoma, kepragma. Um, he, he wasn't a pleasant character, um, though he was an incredibly intelligent one. Um, I end with just the question. This is the end, don't worry. Yeah, no, I'm sorry. This is the end. The younger generation. Who was left? Who took things on? And we have three figures. Alexandros Logotheti, the son of um, the Logotheti, who'd been in uh, cahoots with uh, Lucieri and with the Ottomans. Yanis Mamoraturis, um, who was of Albanian origin and got on very well with Byron, um, taught him Greek, wrote him a poem, all sorts of things, um, and Petros Revelakis. Now, all three of these signed up and created the Philomuzos Eteria, 
uh, a society in uh, 1813 who had, which had particular um, um, interests in education and then also beginning to collect books for a library and into being involved with archaeology and antiquities and serving as a museum for uh, pieces that are found. And we begin to find that travellers, as they had said they wanted anything for this museum that the travellers couldn't take home, and we find that um, gifts are being given by travellers to the Philomusos Eteria, to the first museum, as they called it, in Athens, including um, uh, Thomas Bergen, who we will hear about later. He gave a piece to, to this museum, as it first was. Um, and these characters, or at least um, Mama Turis and um, Revalakis, were also part of the Filiki Eteria, which was a, a political, aggressive society aiming at um, freedom for the Greeks. Uh, it is Revelakis who is the, the interesting one at the end. He was um, complicit with the travellers. He helped them excavate. Um, he seems to have acted as an inspector of sites, keeping, perhaps as we begin to understand, an eye on them for the Eteria. Um, he also collected and excavated on his own land. And we see on the bottom right a piece that lost piece that he had found and um, was, was drawn and kept. And once one comes back to this idea of the total complicity of Athenian um, society with the leading people and the church being complicit with um, the Ottomans in Constantinople, but how else were these people to learn about archaeology and the the, the importance of their heritage without actually working alongside the travellers and learning about what we call archaeology from them in order to in, put it back into the idea of protecting Greek heritage. I'm sorry I've gone on so long. Thank you, Geoffrey. I think you underestimated the uh, uh,